being hosted by the Alternative Banking Group of Occupy Wall Street. Um, this is our information. We meet every Sunday up at Columbia, the International Affairs Building, room 409. We talk about uh, whatever is current, current affairs. We have we post on our website, um, allbanking.net, the topics for the week. And generally, members or people who, who uh, contribute to the, the discussion can actually post an article uh, for discussion, and then at the meeting we sort of uh, vote on which articles we want to discuss. And then we also uh, take larger uh, projects, oh, come on. like, uh, for so. example, we wrote a book on um, the, the, the financial collapse in 2008 called Occupy Finance, um, and the book is actually online. Um, we're going we're gonna to bring uh, some books, but, you know, there are too many too many cooks per one uh, kitchen, so uh, there's, there's actually a, uh, a syndrome of this. There are too many people who are planning on one thing, everybody thinks the other person is going to do it, and then nothing ever happens, right? <laughs> so we don't have the books with us. Um, uh, not to shame anybody who did really bring books, but... Um, <laughs> 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 if you come to the Sunday meetings, I will give you a book. <laughs> There you go. Um, and also we have guest speakers. Normally we we meet at um, we're three to five p.m., but we very frequently have guest speakers from two to three. And one of the larger projects that we've had over the last year has been universal basic income because it comes up in our discussions over and over again, and there was a sense that we need to understand it better and think about it. Um, and we're sort of at the point at which we might be writing and publishing uh, some pieces on universal basic income. And of course, the first thing that came up, really the first thing that came up was universal basic income was poverty. And these are very interesting um, programs, or different programs in some ways, and in other ways, very similar. Um, universal basic income is interesting because uh, it is it has been promoted by the far right, you know, um, the, the architect of neoliberalism, Milton Friedman, uh, supported this. And you can see sort of why it is a kind of wage subsidy, and it can be seen as uh, corporate welfare. Um, it, uh, the, the centrists in Finland are promoting it, are experimenting with it, largely because they want to get the, uh, the welfare you. trap, they want to eliminate the welfare trap. That is, people on welfare will not take a job because the job is not going to get them uh, uh, any more money than their welfare check. Uh, so their view of UBI is to give an incentive to people who are unemployed to come back to uh, the workforce um, at low wages. And so uh, from a neoliberal perspective, universal basic income is kind of uh, a dream come true. It can leave wages down, mm -hmm. which can leave prices down. So even though you're giving, taking government <coughs> public money and distributing it to the consumer, you might actually not see inflation from it. So it, it's the neoliberal. And so the question comes up, why should the left promote something that is basically just feeding the beast that the left is most suspicious of? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, a jobs guarantee is a, a much more familiar socialistic view of how to edge out the private sector with government jobs. I mean, this institution, City University of New York, is a, a government jobs program. And the, uh, uh, it edges out the private colleges with the you know, 300,000 or 400,000 students who come here are 300,000 or 400,000 students who are not going to private colleges. That is an essential social, socialized program, and it is transformative. It has the potential <coughs> of transforming 
uh, the private, the, the market, the, econ the economic market in society, um, especially um, if your job's guarantee is saying you know you, you get a certain wage for this, well, the private sector can't offer less than that because you can always why would you work for that when you can work for the jobs? If the uh, workplace conditions are, are poor and the job program has better uh, uh, conditions. And why wouldn't they be that? The government has no interest in profiting by labor or by the produce of labor. Um, it's in, in the interest of, of, uh, of the good of society, not trying to um, deceive the consumer to buy this and that kind of uh, worthless trash. Um, so the jobs guarantee has this potential of being uh, a utopian so socialized future, but we don't see the left um, promoted. We don't see it as um, the, uh, the ideal program for our future. And yet, we see in the left uh, great excitement about UBI, even though it seems to be uh, a neoliberal program. So this is sort of the, the, the question. Maybe this is, there are many different frames to put this discussion in, but there's one. Um, and I'm sure we have a lot of one lot completely of unbiased <laughs> introduction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know so there, I know there's yes. a lot of slack on it, and that's what we're here for. Yeah. So um, we have three panelists: um, uh, Dan Moore, who is a member, active member of the All Bank Group. Um, we have Gerald Adams, who's also uh, an active member, and we have a guest speaker. I'm really immensely pleased to have um, Evelina Cherneva, who's, who's sort of a, the go-to person on Job Guarantee. Um, you, you can read her biography. I won't waste any more time. It's in the program, and it's extraordinarily uh, distinguished, and she's also a really charming person. So I, I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. Um, first of all, I, uh, I've been talking to uh, basic income people for some time, and I uh, was very encouraged earlier, at the earlier panel, I don't know how many of you were at the Jackson panel on uh, basic income, I, I feel like the conversation is shifting a little bit on the, on the basic income side, because there is a, a lot of recognition of some of the pitfalls of the basic income, and so I feel that we are converging towards potentially a common vision for transformation. <coughs> So I want to, I'm here to represent the job guarantee side, and I want to talk about how I see that shared common future, perhaps. We, we seem to have uh, a lot of uh, common concerns, and as I was listening to the earlier discussion, it, uh, it you know, I heard we, that the concerns really boil down to our concerns around work. The whole discussion, the essence of the discussion was uh, work, how we organize our lives, the nature of work, how uh, we make uh, work less precarious, how we re-envision work, how we re-envision provisioning, and all of it was about work and how we organize society. Actually, very little was about income, right? It was about, so I, I kept sitting, and I, I sat down and I kept thinking, you know, what are we building here? Are we building an income movement or are we building a labor movement? And which of, uh, you know, how do we use these policies to sort of strengthen um, the position of, of labor people uh, in, uh, in, in the economy? So, um, it seems one unique um, advocacy point on the universal basic income side is that it might perpetuate a post work society, and this is in and of itself a worthy goal. And my position on this issue is, well, it depends on what you mean by work. Um, and so where I come uh, from, and when I think about the job guarantee, I'm just going to jump straight to the conclusion where I find a, a bridge between the basic income and the job guarantee policy is the proposal that actually emerges from the basic income literature, and that is Tony Atkinson's proposal for participation income. So when I think about the job guarantee, this is how I re-envision, uh, that's what I envision what the job guarantee might look like. Um, so I, uh, I want to discuss a little bit some of the features of the job guarantee, 
And uh, my understanding is that we need to interrogate the macroeconomics a little bit of the job guarantee as, uh, as it compares to a basic income guarantee. And um, so what it is, you know, why uh, and how we might uh, accomplish this potentially shared uh, vision. So um, the first thing is that I, I basically reject the, uh, uh, the notion that there's an in inevitability of unemployment, that uh, somehow this is the way of thinking and globalization and technology make things worse. And to me, these are problems by design, and we simply need a different design. Um, I also reject um, a common theme, common thread that I, I, I hear when we talk about progressive policies, and that is that somehow we need um, to find the financial resources to fund those programs. And so I want to take just a moment to say um, that I think we need to move away from this neoliberal frame that we need to soak the rich to pay for the poor. To me, this is probably the, the single most important obstacle to putting in place progressive policies going forward. And by that I mean that we live in a monetary economy, in a, in a type of monetary system that permits the funding of policy priorities without <coughs> relying on somebody's tax uh, income, right? So tax collections. And maybe to some of you this is new, maybe to others this is, this is well, well understood, but I constantly hear this, how do we fund universal basic income? How do we fund public education? How do we fund, we cannot begin the conversation from there because the minute we begin there, we've lost the conversation. Somebody's gonna come around and tell you, well, sorry, we ran out of money and these are not our policy priorities. We have a collapsing financial sector we've got to save. That's the policy priority. So, you know, we, we need to, to shift. And so I think we need to fight for policies on their own merits, not, uh, and not put an artificial stumbling block. In our monetary economy, things are, fund, uh, are funded one, once they are appropriated. When, the con when Congress gets together, appropriates a budget, we have institutions that ensure that no government checks are bounced. We have Treasury, we have Federal Reserve, they ensure that all policy priorities are funded and tax collections are always after the fact. They're sort of a reflux, you know, once the government has, uh, it spends in its own resource. The government spends in its own resource. And that, to me, this is a precondition to understanding the possibilities before us. All right, so the job guarantee. Well, um, in some ways I can, I, I, I appreciate the fact that the job guarantee is a bit of a loaded term. It has its own sort of job, right? It is a bit of a liability, and so we've inherited this term. I mean, I like it. Um, but uh, when I think of a job, I think of uh, public service work. I think of employee last resort. I think of participation income. Um, I, I think of participate, uh, of uh, sort of a re-envisioning of what a job is. Um, it's a guarantee because it is a promise. It's a promise, it's an assurance. It's a promise that if you wish to find remunerative, meaningful work opportunities, we guarantee that they will be one for you. That's what the program uh, attempts to, um, to offer. The way it is proposed in the literature is that it's a permanent program. In other words, it's an ongoing stand on standby policy and whoever comes and knocks on the door and says, you know, I've, I've, I've been looking for work, I want work, I want good work and decent work, we promise that we will provide uh, that opportunity. Um, it provides work at a base wage, and again, we, we think of a base wage as in broader terms, that it provides the minimum living standard of life, but also provides a base wage benefit package, and as such, it establishes the standard for the economy. If the job guarantee guarantees anyone work at a living wage for the public good uh, with guaranteed vacation package and maybe health benefits and maybe uh, reduced working hours, whatever you may desire that basic standard to be, then that's the base pay for the job guarantee that becomes the standard for the economy as a whole. And in other words, it is a, a genuine opportunity to opt out of punitive private sector work that provides demeaning working conditions, uh, poverty pay, etc. So if, uh, if, we, if we were um, to implement a policy like this, the private sector has to match those terms. Mm. And it is 
also an opportunity that is provided in a location that is close to um, the people who need it in, in their communities. So the crucial component of the job guarantee um, is that it divorces the offer of a job, the offer of employment, from the profitability of employment. In, in this re-envisioning, it is, um, first of all, it's a guarantee. Whether, whether it's not, we're not giving a, uh, someone work because we can reap profit from that work, but because we believe that they have the right uh, to uh, decent work and decent pay. Second, it uh, is organized around production for people and planet, around production for the public purpose. It is measured, its success is measured not by its cost benefit analysis so that there is some monetary profit at the end of the day, but in terms of did we achieve the social objectives? <coughs> did we have to do some water cleanup here? You know, did we uh, did we provide some care um, uh, needs for, for people? We 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 established different standards of success as well, and they are uh, based on the public purpose. Um, that in of itself opens the possibility of how you might organize it, what kind of jobs you might want to include. Um, you know. Uh, just redefining what, what you value, what you don't value, who should show up for work, who can be at home and care, um, and uh, provide, you know, uh, and be supported nonetheless. So let me just um, draw some of the additional distinctions between the job guarantee and the private sector. The private sector hires for profit, right? Total employment is determined because it's profitable to hire that extra additional person. Okay? Job guarantee hires because it guarantees that you will be hired. The private sector will always hire those who are employed first. Those who are unemployed get hired last. Mm. And it is precisely the problem we're trying to solve, the unemployment problem that the private sector doesn't, cannot solve, right? You always hire the person who has a job, who's been out of a job for a short period of time, but the person who's been out of work or in and out of precarious work for a very long period of time, they're the last ones that can climb this private sector <coughs> job ladder. So the private sector cannot quite solve this, you know, trap at the bottom, you know, unemployability creating, you know, reserve army of labor condition, right? The job guarantee uh, uh, guarantees employment for those at the bottom. Um, the private sector fits people to jobs. The job guarantee does the opposite. It fits jobs to people. And right? we look at people and say, you know, what, what can we, you know, what kind of work, socially useful work? Uh, can we give you to do? How can we use, use your abilities and faculties in the most meaningful way uh, rather than train you, retrain you, and try to fit you in a particular kind of project? We tailor the jobs to people, their capacity, their abilities, their desires. We also marry the needs of the community with the people who could do the work. Right? So that is sort of the public purpose um, aspect. All right, and the job guarantee, of course, recognizes that, that people experience multiple deprivations. Right? It's not just the absence of jobs, you know, there's lack of care, there's a uh, lot of, lack of uh, um, after school activities for children, there's lots of, you know, there's lots and lots of public squalor. So it is, it is that tool for mobilizing our, our, our potential to transform the community. Now, so, let me just run through a handful of, uh, of arguments that I usually make in support of the job guarantee in contrast with UBI. How many minutes do I have? I mean, how much? Uh, You're going to have another four or five. Four or five minutes? <laughs> okay. Well, um, you know, I usually run through a, a, a five or six arguments, and maybe I'll leave some for the discussion, but let me start with, um, with several. Um, I, the job guarantee is a method of inoculation, in a sense. There are enormous social costs that arise from unemployment. And it's a preventative policy. If it is a policy that guarantees full employment at all phases of the business cycle, it already prevents all of the enormous social and economic costs that emerge from unemployment. So I'm just doing finishing a paper for you. It's probably going to be out next week, but um, it is on on the um, on the impact of unemployment on public health, on mortality, on families, 
there is an enormous body of literature, and our macro policy and macro thinking is just not informed by this body of literature from from the health, uh, public health, and uh, uh, economics and health uh, research. And we know that unemployment not only kills, literally, it increases mortality and suicide rates, but it also has permanent scarring effects on people. Uh, social isolation, loss of uh, loss of connections, loss, permanent loss of income. But it's worse than that. It's not just the unemployed people themselves. It is their families, their children have negative mm -hmm. uh, outcomes, uh, their spouses, etc., partners. And so, when you go for this literature, you realize that actually creating a job for its own sake is a necessary thing. That employment in and of itself. Is, is a good thing because people want it, they need it, it connects them to the community. And so um, the job guarantee has that one function that is it prevents this, this mass um, sort of contagion effect that emerges from bouts of, of mass unemployment. Okay. So, so I can talk in greater detail about uh, the, these costs, which are already paid for. We, society already bears them in financial terms, in real terms, you know, we can simply spend our resources in a better way um, and pay for a program that improves the human condition and the communities and enhances human capital and empowers people in various ways to participate in the community or uh, find other work as they, uh, as they wish. All right, so um, that's the first aspect. The second aspect that I like to um, uh, emphasize is that we still operate within the bounds of an unstable capitalist economy, right? an economy that moves through cycles, ups and downs. And the job guarantee has this added macroeconomic benefit that it expands with recessions and it shrinks in uh, expansions. It, is, it, it functions counter-cyclically. We already unemployment functions counter-cyclically, except the current model disposes of people, right? If you if you have a recession, Lowe's and Home Depot lay off 5,000, 10,000 people, and that's that's the stabilizer, right? We give them a little bit of support and we, we pro, you know, provide a floor to collapsing demand, but it's still a contagion effect. You have to see how unemployment rapidly accelerates, very slowly recovers. So like it or not, cap capitalism is going to move through these um, counter-cyclical waves, and the job guarantee is an employment safety net that captures uh, those who have lost their work, wish to find more work, um, expands expenditure that way, and then contracts um, after uh, the economy recovers, and people find uh, alternative means of employment if, if they so desire. Um, so we will always have a buffer, but the universal basic income guarantee does not provide that buffer. It does not count, uh, fluctuate counter-cyclically, right? It is provided to anyone, rich or poor, rain or shine, expansion or recession, it's always there. So it doesn't have the unique counter-cyclical feature that the job guarantee offers. Um, I think that the job guarantee strengthens labor power far more than the universal basic income. We can discuss this. Um, um, in the Q&A, but the problem with the labor market is not whether you're able to opt out of the labor market. It's not whether you can tell your employer, no, I don't want to work this punitive job. The question is what happens when you want to opt in the labor market? If you want the job, will that job be there? And under what conditions will that job be there? So perhaps the basic income UBI can allow people to opt out of work, uh, but should they wish employment, then you still have to do something to provide decent jobs at decent pay. Right? And, um, and the job guarantee uh, does that. Um, and finally, uh, well, well, two more points. I see it as an institutional vehicle that uh, can allow us to achieve various other socioeconomic goals. It's a tool for planning, if you will, of the community for mobilization. Whether you want to envision a Green New Deal, whether you want to uh, see sustainable agriculture, whether you want to have a National Care Act, whatever it is that you desire, then we, this is the institution. It's not just we provide an income and let the market sort itself out and figure out where people vote with their dollars. It is actually a deliberate process of thinking about 
uh, how we, uh, we rebuild those communities. And the final, final point um, that I want to stress is that we uh, live in a monetary system, which is a fiat currency monetary system. And the wonderful thing about this is that it doesn't, you know, uh, money is not a scarce resource. We can fund our policy priorities because money is a simple public monopoly. It's a, it's a monopoly. You, you, can, you can emit as much currency as you like to fund whatever it is you like. But the bad news is that it is a fiat currency system. If you emit a ton and you haven't created product or social useful work, your money might not be worth anything. So you have to worry about what is the, how can we have mobilized our real resources? What is the money, money worth? Have you created inflation? Have you anchored the value in, of the currency in appropriate output? And the job guarantee anchors the value of the currency in labor power. It says that you're guaranteed decent work at decent pay for $15 an hour. And that is the value of the currency. $15 are always gonna be worth, worth one hour of social useful work. I'll stop here. <laughs> Uh, I didn't mention that uh, Bablina is uh, uh, an exponent of the modern monetary theory, of MMT, uh, which is a heterodox and ra I think radical um, model, uh, but is, is growing in uh, adherence. Uh, Excuse me. And, and she's a Thanks for that. That was, that was instructive for, for all of us. Um, Dan? So I'm the kind of person who wants to do something practical. So I was tasked with UBI. So how many people here would like to receive $250 a month from the government? <laughs> Every, nobody, oh, really, that's you? That's it? Everybody else does also? That's it? Uh, Wait, what? What's the catch? That's all I'm What's the catch? Because there's a catch. A month, you just get a check from the government into your checking account. Here's how I work it out. So, while UBI is sometimes considered, well, I'm going to get enough to live on, that's, from what I can see, one, I sort of agree with Pavlina, there's a lot of socially useful work that needs to be done, so I really don't want to pay people to do nothing. But I did come up with an idea, and I'm not sure where it comes from, but it's just out there. So essentially what I said was, I think it was Warren Mosler in one of his talks was talking about, well, if you want to create demand, you can basically just refund people's social security taxes. And I was like, oh, well, how much would that be? So the idea that I came up with was one of the things that we want to talk about is how do we get these ideas out into the real world in a practical way. So essentially what I said was, I'm going to take $50,000. I'm going to mark that as the baseline because if you take the FITA taxes, the Social Security taxes, for $50,000 of income, that's the round number. $50 a month. So there's a cap on Social Security. So if you make 125000 roughly, all the income you make above that, you don't pay Social Security tax on it. So that's also a built-in way to start paying for things. So essentially what I was going to come up with, and again, this is not universal, it's very specific to our current existing Social Security system. Okay. So phase one would be everybody who's currently employed, if you make less than $50,000 a year, the Social Security Administration would credit you with a job that pays $50,000 a year. So if you look at your Social Security history, you can look down in your teenage years, you may have years of zero income. Well, that would change. They would all be $50,000. So the, the least amount of money that you would be credited for your old age retirement would be $50,000 a year. Now that costs nothing up front. The Social Security Administration can say, okay, everybody who made less than $50,000, we're just gonna round you up and you're good for $50,000. So we do that for everybody who has a job. 
everybody who's ever had a job, and everybody who wants to sign up for a social security account. Okay, so if you, you're 22 and you're in school and you're not working, you can sign up for an account and you get credited with $50,000 a year for your pension. And most people will think, what good is that for me now? I want cash now, right? So that's where the $250 comes from. Phase two is essentially rebate social security taxes to everybody, okay? Up to $50,000 in income. Now, since we've just made everybody's minimum $50,000, that means everybody gets the first $50,000 taxes that they pay, the 6%, they get those back. So that's the universal part. Everybody who works, everybody who has ever worked, everybody who signs up to be part of the program basically gets $3,000 a year. Now to put that in context, in New York City, $3,000 is like maybe I could go a month on that. <laughs> Paying my rent, buying food, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the only other existing basic income, which is the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend, they basically have somewhere between $1,000 and $1,800 a year as a cash payout to every citizen of Alaska. So that was the other thing that we had talked about was, well, how would you pay for it? So essentially, one, we're guaranteeing people's retirement income by increasing the base wage for which their future social security. Now, if you're 60 years old, that might help a little bit if you make $20,000 a year. It'll bump you up, it will help you a little bit. If you're 22, and you make $50,000 a year for the next 30 years, then your social security that you're gonna get from this is gonna be much more than if you were making 10,000, 20,000, 35, whatever, right? It's gonna give you a good base. And it also gives you a basis by which people can justify the rebates. Now, that's sort of the working mechanism that says, how do we pay for it? You can increase the cap on social security and you can basically provide tax refunds via the Social Security Administration. This gives an incentive and gives cash to everybody. It is progressive, I guess, because people at lower wages currently are gonna benefit more in the future and currently because if I make $20,000 or $25,000, I haven't paid $3,000. I'm getting more than I paid in currently. So that idea is a base, it's not a basic income, it is a, a supplementary income, let's say, because a basic income implies full coverage of your needs. And I, I don't see a way of paying for that at this time, but I think giving people $3,000 a year cash in their checking accounts will make a big difference to a lot of people in terms of helping them reduce insecurity, um, helping them pay for things like rent, food, uh, debt that they carry now. Um, and also, one thing I didn't mention yet was for children. If you're between 30 and 18, you too would have $50,000 credited, and your $3,000 a year would be paid not into your checking account, but into a savings fund, so that when you reach 18, you then have roughly $55,000 to help with any education that you wanna be involved in. So this is a way to address the need for supplemental cash to help market demand, which is flagging, even though we still have, uh, even though unemployment is higher, I think unemployment numbers, there's still a lot of people who aren't working. The economy is not recovered to where it could have been prior to the 2008 crash. Um, so there is a demand lacking in the economy. This gives a direct um, floor for that, or it provides support. But it also doesn't provide a It's not feeding into the market-based thing. It's supplementing people's cash. Everybody's talking about that. They're not going to get anything from the market to address everybody's needs. Where the Okay, well now we're just going to raise prices and it's going to cost you $60,000 a year and then you get perhaps a spiraling upwards of cost versus benefit. What else do I have in here? 
Okay, so essentially this mechanism gives two benefits. The first phase says we're going to make it so that for people who are retiring who are past a certain age, we're going to raise the floor for them in terms of their income that's provided by an existing system. And then phase two, once you've gotten that passed, is we're going to give rebates to people now that will allow them to have extra cash in their pocket. Um, essentially, this is a dividend from the billions of dollars that are in the quote unquote Social Security trust fund. Additionally, if you're at the trust now, what is your Social Security going to be? How many people here think Social Security? Right? That's what you're told. Well, Social Security cannot go broke because it's a direct transfer from here to there. It's not like we've made investments in the equities market and when things are good, then we have more money and things go bad. No, it's the government owes you money, they pay you directly, they pay it, and they, any excess taxes that are collected go into treasury securities. So it's, I have money here and it goes into that account that bears interest. And so any shortfall in taxes, you're shaking your head no, but maybe you can help me out here. <laughs> but based on the thing, the government owes the money and the government will not default on those obligations. Just they cannot the default. They just write the check. They, they create money. The they can create as much money as they need. Tim and, Tim and Alan Greenspan told Tim Ryan, Tim Ryan is trying to get him to say, no, private savings accounts would be better. Alan Greenspan said essentially what Pavlina just said, which was, well, we can never run out of money. We can always pay the money, but will there be anything to buy with that money? And so, which is a totally different question, which is what she's addressing. So the idea is there's lots and lots of money that has been sort of reallocated that is actually FICA taxes that have been paid in. There's trillions of dollars sitting in treasury bills that were taxes collected, income foregone by wage earners over the past 70 years. So giving a rebate or using that money to provide additional support is a way to ease into a basic income concept while at the same time increasing the base income that they will have at retirement. So anyway, that was my practical um, effect. And if you don't like the idea of using the trust fund, you can raise the cap on Social Security payments so that everybody, not just those below 125000 pay those taxes. So the first 50000 you would get a rebate on any taxes. Everybody makes at least 50000 from the viewpoint of the Social Security Administration. And there's the ability to not only help people today with supplemental income, not a true universal basic income, which covers all your needs, but a supplemental income. And then it at least provides a helping hand to move away from a market-oriented solution, both for labor and for goods and services at a broader scale. So hopefully I've created some controversy and we can talk more. I never know what Dan is going to say because he always brings his, his latest ideas, so this was a surprise to me. Um, Gerald? Uh, oh, I get to talk yes, to you? Yes, you get to talk to you. What? Yeah. Oh, I would have paid if I know this is great. Uh, I liked a lot of what you had to say about job guarantees. One of the best versions of that I've heard. Uh, still some things I, I, I think it misses. Um, start by saying my notion and my attraction to the notorious BIG, Basic Income Guarantee. Uh, we call it that because uh, even on the left, people spit on it, uh, apart from people doing it on the right. And it's for one particular reason, which I'll get to a bit later, but I think centrally, Human beings have value. Human beings don't have a value that can easily be assessed, of course, by a monthly check. So we'll never get something that covers the value of a human being on a monthly basis. But I think uh, for adult human beings that are, at the very least, citizens of a country, 
they should be showed something by that nation, that they have that. Now, it usually is the other way around. As an adult, you have to first prove yourself to the nation. You have to prove yourself to the government, prove yourself to the overall uh, overarching capitalist society and so on by getting your skills together, going out there, and quote unquote, earning a living. Repugnant phrase, earning <laughs> a living. Why should I have to earn my right to be on this uh, planet? So, I think from that alone, on that pure principle, we should have a basic guaranteed income. And I feel also that we have a situation where, where people, especially in the current circumstance, fall into things like unemployment and so forth, and then having, as Pavlina said, all of these horrible uh, things that accompany it, the depression, uh, the suicide, the sense of worthlessness and so on. Well, this comes from, again, having uh, the value uh, placed in the wrong direction. The value as it is currently placed, you gain the value by hunting the job and then showing that you're worth it. I want to spin that on its head. It's the person that's worth it, and then you get a job to a system and staying on the planet. So I, I do not, um, I do not subscribe uh, to a notion of hunting jobs or even there being jobs out there that are provided to you, uh, and that you still have to uh, gain some sort of psychological benefit from by having. Because this is the rough end of it. When we, when we value ourselves in terms of uh, the job we have and the money we get back from it, um, it, is what brings danger when there is employment. Or what brings for a very bad date if you can't tell a woman that you're doing X for a living. <laughs> there are, see, so much is built into this having a job business and proving your value business by how much you earn. And so I want to kill all of that. And basic income will be a very good start. And I want it as a very separate matter, too. I want it as a very distinct entity. I know Pavlina essentially has it uh, enfolded in, in a jobs guarantee in some sense, right? But I don't want it enfolded because I, that's, that's being too shy. I want it out there. And I think um, the gentleman that introduced us all in the early going um, also has a notion of the expansion of welfare, where it's again shyly enfolded uh, in, in this expansion of welfare. I don't, want it, I don't want it in any way ducking the limelight. I want it right out there. You are alive, you're a human being, you're a, you're a citizen of, of, of this country. You deserve a basic income. All else can happen around that. Other things can be taken care of, which will be fine. But I want that statement made. And I don't want to be shy about it. I don't want to apologize for it. I don't want to have to dress it up in any fashion. Uh, Going back to the, the, the business of uh, the depression and so on, and the, what, what happens to people that are unemployed. Um, when, you, when, you, when you look to find yourself through work, and I know a lot of people on the left follow this thinking. Um, uh, Doug Henwood about a month ago had someone talking about basic income. And uh, the reason why with Doug Henwood, it is a notorious B.I.G. He, he made at the end of the program a statement, quoted uh, the North, I don't know if it was Conrad, I can't remember, um, saying that, um, well, I don't enjoy work, but I realize the importance of it. 
how much uh, being in the workforce and so on, going out there and working, has made me grow as a person. How, excuse me, how important that is. And that's, that's, so, that's why, I, in a sense, I'm getting the sense of who I am from. Being at work, doing work. My problem with that is that I can find also many people having left the army who can talk about how, as a self, as a human being, they gained their value, they found out who they really were from their years in the army or their time in the army, their time in battle. And, and the sense of uh, camaraderie and togetherness that they gain uh, from uh, their fellow troops and so forth and their mission accomplished and all of that. And they would never have found it any place else, including on an assembly line or whatever job you have out there. All of those other jobs would have been Relative to this, pathetic, because this is the way you enter into, in, in, in that limited case, in some way some of those men would speak of, manhood. But I think here, generalized as finding my true person. So we can always, in the struggle of having to do something uh, that uh, we don't really care for, find value and find our character in it because of our sense of resistance our knowledge of how maybe dangerous or unpleasant the thing is, but yet we overcame it, and so we grew from it. And I understand that, that. but it's not necessary. You don't have to find it there. Uh, now again, probably has a partial answer to this because she does talk about uh, expanding uh, the notion of work and hence doing things in your community, which would bring a far greater sense of um, value and finding out who you are so on and so forth, and, and all of that's fine. But I'm saying that at the, at the same time, none of this has to come within the arena of work. And I think the people who are presently unemployed uh, don't have an employment problem, they have an income problem. If they have the income, <coughs> unless they have a spectacularly grand ideas, uh, the job is quite secondary. And so, for me, it's a question of what do we do for lack of income, not for lack of work. I think we uh, uh, battled on it long enough, at least I have. <laughs> um, so we can open it up. Lots of people here, lots of ideas. Uh, first hand, uh, Kathleen, I wonder if you could uh, tell us what the leading institute is and where it is. And you mentioned uh, Tony Atkinson, who he is, and local teachers and whatever. <coughs> My main question is, uh, job guarantee sounds appealing, if it can be won. And I wonder if the way you're going to win things like a job guarantee is with a class-based outlook. And I use as an example a wealth tax to differentiate us from Democrats and any other group that is funded by uh, wealthy donors. A wealth tax that looks to go after the wealth of the hedge fund guys and the uh, top 1% and it charges them 5 to 7% a year and at the same time uh, eliminates or greatly reduces the federal income tax on people under $70,000. To me that kind of class-based argument might fit into uh, your jobs guarantee but I the job guarantee at this point seems totally utopian. <clears throat> that there's no way that you can, I mean, obviously a long range educational battle and you convince people, maybe. But to me, what we face right now is eruptions, is the system is this sta this not stable. And therefore, I think we should move forward with what I, inter what I would like to see is radical demand. 
And I would like to, you know, if I push a wealth tax, I'm also going to be pushing the jobs guarantee because it sounds plausible and good. Okay, so um, we're going to take questions now. Those who do not know, the Levy Economics Institute is a research uh, institute based at Bard College. Um, we, our patron saint economist, <laughs> is Hyman Minsky, and so is Wynne Broadley. And um, Minsky is known uh, well for financial reform and uh, for the financial instability hypothesis, but he wrote a lot on employment issues and income inequality issues, and hearing his wife talk about it, those were closer to his heart. Um, though most people know the Minsky, the financial instability and hypothesis of Minsky. We've, we've done a considerable amount of policy work. Um, I myself have been involved in, a, in a, um, studying and evaluating a program in Argentina that was directly modeled after the employed last resort proposals that we had advocated in the United States. Um, Tony Atkinson is interesting. Is a, 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 he is um, the advisor of, um, uh, of Piketty. Um, supervised him, and he uh, wrote Participation Income, and towards the end of his life, he actually talked about public employment. He didn't even talk about Participation Income. And I, but I think that that's, he has the same kind of vision that I have about what the employee last resort might look like. So when I was talking about how the job guarantee might transform the nature of work, these are the aspirational ideas that we might have in our progressive agenda. Um, I do not consider this at all utopian. To me, it is very practical, and uh, we see it, we, we've seen it done around the world, um, usually as, as emergency measures. I mean, we kind of invented the model, the, the very flawed model, you know, the New Deal model. I want to acknowledge it was a very flawed model, but, but it, it provided um, an, an idea of how you address people's needs and they can serve a public purpose and enhance the public good. There are other models around the world, I'm very happy to talk about them. Um, and so, because capitalism is, is unstable, investment is, is unstable, consumption is unstable, it's almost a mandatory policy. Because we don't allow people to be subject to the vagaries of the instability of the financial sector, of investment, of the profit motive, of expectations, etc. So it's almost an absolutely essential safety net that has to, that, uh, needs to be uh, there. I, I do want to, uh, okay, so wealth tax, and I want to address something um, uh, that Gerald uh, mentioned. So the wealth tax, you know, the question is, why do you want the wealth tax? You know, I want a wealth tax because, because it buys our democracy, it corrupts our democracy, right? Wealth concentrated at the top, you know, corrupts, uh, you know, buys politicians. That's why I want a wealth tax. I don't want a wealth tax because I want to fund my job guarantee, because I don't need it. I need Congress to get together and say, here's a full employment act, here's a budget, it's going to be you know, an on-pay-as-you-go policy. We write the checks the way we write any checks. You know, I don't want to pretend that somehow there is a tax that funds a particular policy, the way we pretend with Social Security. That's right. right? You, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an artificial construct that is completely unnecessary because I, you know, I don't pay a war tax to fund wars. Right? I don't pay a Wall Street tax to, to fund, you know, subsidies to Wall Street. So let's just dismiss that entire argument. Valuing life, I, this is a very important argument, but I reject the notion that giving people income recognizes their worth. That if I give you $50,000, I say I value as a human being. As a, as, a, as a public sector, my function as a government is to demonstrate my people that I value their life by offering their security, giving them clean water, mm -hmm. access to education, doing, valuing the things they need in terms of real resources. And providing income alone presumes that those real resources will be there or somehow we, together, collectively, will compete and the private market will happily satisfy our needs. You know, the private market already doesn't satisfy the needs with income. We can give a few more people income, and it's still not going to satisfy the needs. The problem is organizing our production. Um, and so, you know, job guarantee, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put an enormous burden on the job guarantee because we really have to rethink how we produce. Right? And, and the job guarantee is, is this bridge that says, you know, we recognize that people want to work. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to judge how one defines their own self-worth and what 
they want, but what I know is that they want work. And, and I know that the private sector often provides demeaning work. It also provides good work, right? So, um, so it, it's not my job to tell people they should desire post-work society. I can educate, but if people want work, my job is to design good old work opportunities. And that's how I see the job guarantees uh, mission. The problem of the unemployed is not income. We have countless of surveys where we, ch we ask people why they wanted, uh, like the Argentina program is, you know, has a, a very clear survey. Why did they want to work? And they said, I can do something. That was number one. I have income was fourth out of fifth reasons why people wanted that job guarantee policy. I work in a good environment. I learn things. I'm in part of my community. Income was the second to last. And so it is, Work is this very multifaceted thing, and I think that our, you know the way I see it is the job guarantee kind of puts the you know the, the private sector's feet to the fire and says match this standard. We would like to raise the floor by providing a labor standard, and the private sector then matches it. Uh, did I quickly respond? <laughs> I never said that we are going to look for. Uh, <coughs> basic income and all else falls away. So this is not a case of I get check X and I'll take care of my own <coughs> clean water and so on, so on. So all of these other things we, that we fight for uh, as progressives should remain. I am just saying that this should be distinct <coughs> and again without apology. So I think that, like at the beginning, you mentioned that you think the federal jobs guarantee is more transformational potentially, but I think the point that Gerald is making is actually that we can transform society and the way that we think about our own self-worth and, and, and others' worth, and that's why I, I really think that this like UBI is an amazing idea. But I also wanted to ask you what you think about the idea that on a lot of the panels I've been listening to here, having to have a huge government bureaucracy that basically redefines work in ways that would be valuable to people, so meaningful work, our child care, things that we want to do with our time, that we could do if we had a UBI, but could potentially be con like included in a federal jobs guarantee, um, I think puts a lot of um, like respect to their or trust in a government institution that we have not seen to deliver those sorts of things for us. Whereas a UBI would allow us to deliver those things for ourselves, um, which may be a little libertarian for this scene, but it's how I feel. <laughs> um, so again, my, my position is that we have to ask of our government to serve us. That it, we can't just say, oh, government's corrupt. Like it's, it, it is, it, we are buying into that narrative that, well, look, government is dysfunctional, and therefore, we just want to find other means of provisioning. Ultimately, the problems that we are going to discuss are the problems of clean water, the problem of how we organize production, provisioning, whether it is ourselves or others. We are still situated in this paradigm with certain property rights, right? We are still within this, this framework. So the, the ability to somehow self-organize production that will satisfy the minimum provisioning outside of government or the market system, to me, is, is just a non-starter. Like we, we have to have an idea of how the production process takes place. How do you acquire the minimum necessary capital that you need to be able to organize your own daycare, schools, colleges, I don't know what it is exactly, health services, what is it that we're looking to provide for ourselves outside of the market and outside of government? Yeah, but I think Joel is saying that you would, you would, the government should, we should still be fighting for healthcare and right. education. Right, so that speaks to the next problem. That's already bureaucracy. That's already, we already have to deal with that problem. So in other words, then the fight has to be how we make those better, those mechanisms better for provisioning, because they're gonna have to be there anyway for whatever the next society or you know, system we would want. So we can't escape the difficult work of rethinking what shall we prioritize, how shall we organize it, what do we consider efficient use of resources. Giving income is, is easy. So if I may, um, we currently have an extremely efficient bureaucracy set up for basic income. <laughs> Social Security is the mechanism that was set up by FDR to keep people out of poverty, okay? That's essentially what basic income does, 
is to preserve dignity for old, sick, orphans, a variety of people. So if you look at what, how much is needed for me to live, if I'm 67 or 68 years old, and I haven't been working in an extremely lucrative field, um, let's say I'm a day laborer, or I've been working a blue collar job making less than $50,000, I haven't had a chance to accumulate. After 2008, I probably lost my house. I probably lost a lot of things. Even if I had investments, I probably lost those. This is the floor, okay? So it may not matter to somebody who's of working age, but somebody who can't work anymore for whatever reason, this is the system that's currently in place. And if the left doesn't want to recognize the good work that was done in the past to help support people with the floor, then, sorry, can't help you there. But it is one of the most efficient systems out there. It's way more efficient than market-based solutions for investments. Having been on Wall Street, they're charging 2 and 3%. The overhead for Social Security is infinitesimal compared to Wall Street. So my argument is, by going in and asking for very specific things in existing programs, we are paying it forward. Now, it's our kids who will be better off. I may not be able in 10 years or so, may not be able to collect a reasonable amount of Social Security, um, but you know, will I be under the poverty line? Perhaps. My point is, if we can go in and ask for something now, we'll get into the habit of talking to the people who make these decisions in Washington. We can pressure them for something that's very specific. And it's a step forward to say, you need to raise this. You need to do this. You need to do that. Here's a very specific policy requirement we're asking of you. And there's money there to fund it right now. You don't have to do anything. It's all right there. You can do it now. And my point is, by taking something that's practical and pushing on it, if they agree to it, which we'll keep pushing until they do, then we've put certain ideas into their head. And by getting those ideas into their head, that the basic income is $50,000, for, for instance, or whatever we want to make it, we've got the idea out there that that's sort of a minimum. And we can then start pushing for other things. Okay. So anyway, I think we don't want to gloss over existing things that are out there that we can push on and make minor changes and get good results. <laughs> take a few questions at a time. Gentleman in the hat. Um, this is a fascinating conversation. I, I tried to get it earlier because I love this talk. This is basically another channel where I discuss this, these type of topics. Is this somewhat of a false choice? Can we have both? Like, I, I would imagine there are some people who want to work, and I agree with you in the sense of having the federal jobs there. The problem is the model. The problem is the model. The problem is the capitalist model. If you're going to do something to break that particular model, how many federal jobs are going to deal with the floor and says, the private enterprise must in Bernie's keep up a certain standard, otherwise those people can get a job in the federal level. I think that's an awesome idea. But I also like this idea of, well, if there's a basic floor that somebody can't afford to actually work, they have a basic floor in regards to their income. What's the problem with both? That's why, right. Why is it yeah. either no or? Yeah, why well, can so, implement both? I actually think that, that the negatives of UBI can be ameliorated entirely by a job gap. Absolutely. It depends what UBI we're talking about. Are we, are we promising $50,000 no. to every person? Uh, because to me, you know, $200 every person, go ahead, yes, let's do it tomorrow, right? But what are we talking about? $25,000, we, we have the money. Right, fifty thousand, rich or poor, that to me is not the way to go for a number of reasons. Um, number one, um, I discussed this point a little bit earlier, but you have to be able to ensure that your currency has value. Now, let me I, I, like walk. Let's walk through this exercise. I'm giving somebody fifty thousand dollars a year. One of the objectives of the UBI camp is that that $50,000 will allow you to opt out of a bad $50,000 job, right? So McDonald's workers are staying at home because they don't want to juggle three jobs, right? Three kids, etc. right? They opt out. Now, 
we want to, and that is supposed to discipline the private sector to match, to provide $50,000 jobs if they want those workers back, right? So now your hamburgers, your hamburger is not $10, it's $50, right? right? And then the $50,000 basic income guarantee is no longer sufficient to buy the standard of life because we've just elevated prices. So I am the, you know, the enlightened policymaker. I'm going to increase the basic income to $60,000, right? Now that on the margin, the $60,000 jobs, you know, people opt out, and to be coaxed back into the market, then the private sector has to match that. And so you have, you erode, continually erode the value of the income grant. No, no, so I, you I, provide I, this one. Fair, I wasn't talking 50,000. In fact, I wasn't thinking anywhere near that. That's what I'm saying. Both. The federal government. So, so the way I see it as both is I'd say anyone willing and able to work, decent job, decent pay, and then you want to what the decent pay is. Some people will be unable to work. Yeah. Uh, universal child allowance is absolutely a compliment. Mm -hmm. um, stay at home parents perhaps should be supported. They will be moms who would want to work, but we, they should be forced to work, yeah. right? Dads, moms, right? They, they should, the caregivers should not be forced. We recognize uh, care as, as socially meaningful, important work. Mm -hmm. They will be the, the hard to employ that, that the private sector will always discriminate against, and the job guarantee provides that. Let's talk about people released from, from prison, right? Yeah. That have such a hard time, you know, finding an apartment. Like the Band the Box uh, move is great, but it's not enough if there's no job waiting, right? And so the job guarantee is that, that sort of transitional program, if you will. And so you can, you can figure out a job guarantee that also says, look, I want to support the artists. There are far too many starving artists and poets and, and musicians coming to the job guarantee. It isn't participation income. We have realized that this is part of our community. It's important for us to support yeah. the artists. So, so you suddenly broaden the definition, Homeless and then there's artists, nobody kind of uh, left in the shadows, if you will. Yeah. Now, I know that the argument is made, you know, the right to serve. So here's 50,000 so you can go serve. No, how about 50,000 so you can teach some kids to serve? Yes. Like, right. I prefer that, right? Yeah, right. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to give you the last question here because we're actually past time. Well, no, no, no. no. Uh, five, 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 Oh, thanks for a provocative panel. Um, I know I for one have gotten really excited over here. Um, so I don't think anyone in this room would actually be like disappointed if they heard that tomorrow we're going to implement a job guarantee or tomorrow we're going to implement a UBI. We'd all be excited, right? Um, so the question is like, um, what could go wrong, and what would the implementation details actually uh, um, comprise? Uh, my biggest fear with job guarantee is that. Who gets to decide what's socially useful? Um, if, you know, if, it's, if each person gets to come up and say, I would like to stay at home and take care of my kids and paint, and that's what I will be paying $50,000 to do, um, then I don't see the difference between that and UBI, because you can give me UBI, and I'll stay home and take care of my kids and paint. So really, there's no difference. And while I'm at it, I don't understand why in the, the, fir the first case, we wouldn't have to worry about inflation, but in the latter case, we would. Like, I just don't understand that argument. Um, the, the idea here is that we are taking a, with UBI, um, which I also worry about, I'll go into that for a second, and I have a question. Um, the, um, with the UBI, that we are taking a chance on humanity, saying, given time to yourself, you will do something interesting for humanity, and it will be its own production. So if we're worried about just production problems, then I don't, I don't think we should worry about that. Um, once people are freed up to leave their bad jobs. So the, 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 the big implementation question for me for job guarantee is, who gets to decide what's socially useful? Or another way of saying that is, will the next Trump administration come in and, and just say, okay, you guys want guaranteed guarantee jobs? It's eating shit. That's what you're going to get paid for. <laughs> <laughs> because we know that's what's going to happen. Um, and with UBI, my, my biggest fear is, um, like, is it politically feasible? Um, which is to say, how can we tax the shit out of the rich and all those offshore accounts and all those cor international corporations that have so much power over us and have so much money overseas? Um, which I would like to actually very explicitly take, by the way. I would not like to just start funding this 
and then worry about how to pay for it later. And I know that's not how you think about it, but that is how I think about it. I would like to take that money because it is a direct result of a fucked up capitalist system that they have so much more money than the average person in the first place. So I, and that brings me to my final thing, which is both of these things, if they were implemented tomorrow, we would be all happy in this room, I think, but they wouldn't be enough. Right? They would not address the actual problems. What they would do is they would be, they, what they would succeed in doing is taking the most desperate people in our in our country and giving them a freaking food. Right? That would be a, like a success story for this. You have something to eat, maybe even have health care. That would be a success. But it wouldn't actually solve all the problems. Um, anyway, so my question for you guys is implementation details. How do we guarantee that jobs are actually good? How do we guarantee with UBI? that we are not allowing the government to exclude ex felons or people that are Muslim. That's what I worry about. Anybody want to take that off? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll go for that. Um, of course, none of these things are insulated from the immediate political reality. And so uh, all of the, uh, the both seem to me to provide or come with vulnerabilities. Uh, and we none of us are expecting that we have even even in uh, a one hundred percent democratic, um, progressive democratic uh, regime that somehow they're gonna say yes to the best things. So all, all of these both of these I think entail lots of struggle. Either way you take it, struggle struggle does not go away. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, even to get these little things done, it, it's important. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I want to add something to the whole um, to the whole business of employment um, that I didn't bring up earlier, uh, especially now that it's claimed that the time is almost gone. Why do you want to give us a heart attack like that? Um, that oh, another big thing that we have to consider is that at some point there will be enough AI to prune a tremendous amount of jobs. It won't take away all of the jobs. It may not take away most of the jobs. It will take away a sufficient amount so that it's, it won't be a case of do you want to work? There will be there, but there will be masses of people who would still need income is why I stress we have an income problem before we have a job problem. If I may address the, uh, how would we do these things? I think one of the things that was mentioned by before was the, the location based. So essentially, we have the technology we can take for the equivalent of a referendum, right? Take suggestions. Uh, you could have either government bad word for a lot of people, or you could put together your own website and you could take suggestions in terms of what work needs to be done around here. Now, at my house, it's like I can look out and say, somebody has to mow the lawn, somebody has to clean up the living room, somebody has to do the laundry, right? Who's gonna do what? And that's essentially the same kind of thing, not just from a household, but from a neighborhood, from you know the local area. Um, you can set up local, clearinghouse that says what kinds of work needs to be done and then you can have people vote on it. Now, the funding mechanism and the management mechanism, right? those are the kinds of things like is there anybody who is a good project manager? You might be able to get suggestions from people. Again, you can do all this from the grassroots up, but the big question is, okay, we've got a good idea, we've got a team together, we've got people that we think can actually go do it, build a playground or whatever, where are we going to get the funding? Well, there's lots of that stuff going on now. They, they get money from donations, GoFundMe. They get it from foundations. They get it from a lot of different places, but it's all non-governmental. And I think, essentially, what we're talking about is doing the same kind of thing, but using federal funding to go out and do things that need to be done that the people in those areas have decided for themselves need to be done. Right? That's the way I'm looking at it, and I don't see that that much differently than what you know, Habitat for Humanity or other <clears throat> organizations like that could be. In fact, you could maybe leverage those things, and if you get funding for those things, and everybody in the area 
says yes, then go ahead. You know? So I don't see that as, big, that, that as big a problem as it may be. Yeah, and I think here, I totally agree, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Actually, people have a lot of good ideas of what are jobs and what they would like to see done. And there are already nonprofits and social entrepreneurial ventures that are doing that stuff. It's just they're short of staff. They just need an army of people to do the sorts of things that we need done. I mean, we've got, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but also the other thing is, let's not impose this unique standard on the job guarantee. That somehow, you know, like these, these jobs have to be the absolute perfect jobs and the most efficient jobs and that, uh, you know, there, there's always this sort of a process that you will find in public or private sector jobs of, of figuring out how to do things better. Except here we're doing it on different premises. We're not doing it for profit and for cost minimization purposes. And so um, the, um, the other thing is um, on, on, the, on the jobs going away. I actually disagree with this premise. Yes, there, there's all optimization, and we, for a very long time, we've, we've been losing jobs, you know, since the invention of the typewriter. 90% um, of the jobs of the future have not been invented yet, and, but even if the robots come and take a lot of the jobs, conventional jobs that we think of, we, the, the jobs that we need are largely related to the reproduction of labor. The, the, the jobs that are, the vast majority of jobs in this economy are about how we take care of each other, how we educate each other, take care of each other. Are there limits to this? So even if there are robots out there, we still can create jobs if we rethink our sort of relationships in the community and what we consider to be to be useful work. So with again, actually, the, the problem comes back to production. Who appropriates the benefits of that production? If if you know, AI is owned, it's concentrated in the hands of the few, then the issue is how we redistribute that output. It's not, you know, otherwise it, in, uh, income just gives us access to that system and basically the diet to profit. Yeah, that, that's what I was trying to say. Is that, okay, uh, automation has been going on for a really long time. And what happened, I worked in post-production film. It used to take hundreds of people to finish a film. Now it takes eight. And it's done in a third of the time. And what has happened is that the people who own the equipment and the software have taken all of the profit. And now those eight make less than they used to as part of 200. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that wasn't the promise. The promise was, you know, it was on the cover of Time in 1970-something or other that we were all going to work four hours a day and be rich <laughs> when, automization, uh, uh, yeah. when everything was automated and no one had to work. But, that, but what has happened instead is that a few people absorb all of the profit from it, and everybody else is just saying, well, why do I have a job? Um, so if you go into the guaranteed income or job without addressing the people who took all the profits from the film business, uh, then we all have a problem with basic equity. So we look around and say, and, and uh, you know, this is to your argument of that we don't have to be able to afford it. We just do it because we need to. And I understand that, but there's this basic difficulty in getting people to buy into that that comes from, but wait a second, they just took all the money. How do you address that? But can I just ask one quest question to Pavlina? I think uh, um, maybe a lot of people in the audience are not familiar with the tenets of MMT, and maybe that's the issue. Oh, I don't understand. Okay. Oh. I probably don't. No, no, no. I, I, we don't have to explain all of the tenets of MMT. We just have to recognize that the dollar is a public monopoly. It comes from one thing. That's it. That's all I we're saying. I know something about that, and I agree with you. But, so all, all we're saying is that, that, that we have to move beyond this artificial constraint that the government runs out of money because That's it pays right. in its own resource. It's only the government that pays in a resource. It, it issues itself. We don't. We have to earn that resource. And that in and of itself, just because the monetary system is a, monop a public monopoly, means that uh, the government can fund its public objectives as it does. So we just have to stop pretending that somehow Social Security is different from the other policy per objectives that get funded on an ongoing basis right. without any debate. <clears throat> and so I we say one thing, so I agree, but yeah. does that mean that we do not have to address where did all that money go? 
That, no, you, no, you can address that, but for different reasons. Absolutely. Right, because right. Because we have a facilitator, right. please, and a stack so that uh, people don't care. This is very interesting, but it is not the way an occupied meeting is normally run. And some people may think it is. And I don't like sitting in a room where I can raise my hand from now to tomorrow and nobody is looking at it. Uh, well, I'd like I to know I'm on the list. I have two people on my mental stack, um, two guys, a uh, man in black, and then uh, your flag. Well, not as three, because I've been waving my hand for a while. Or, or don't you put women on the stack. They're, they're, uh, there are a great many people who have their hands up. Great then take people. a stack is what I'm asking you to do. I can't because I don't know the names. But the gentleman in black, please. Okay, what I'm, what I'm curious about is the, um, the range of discussion. Because it seems that uh, the market is completely out of touch. This is out of bounds to discuss. What she's talking about when she's talking about the profits that were taken and the roboticization roboticization of the work that was taken. In other words, the employer got rid of the workers, replaced them with uh, more efficient software, which is what everybody's doing today. That doesn't have anything to do with uh, any kind of monetary fictional value or anything. That has to do with the way that people, uh, certain people are in charge, not just of capital, but in, in charge of the entire way in which the society is structured, which is what you're talking about. And I think that seems to be completely off the, uh, kind of off the whole margin of what you're willing to discuss. Uh, like when we're talking about the New Deal, the New Deal is a very watered down version of what people got in socialist country. So I don't see why that's the beginning model of discussing about how, how to distribute stuff to people. This sounds chintzier than welfare. $200 a month, nobody can live on that. I can't shop on that. That's right. I, people make $200 a day. So, and that's uh, not enough. Right. So <laughs> and I, that's I not enough. That, I think that you're, you're not directing anything toward what's the driving force that creates the poverty and all of this, is, which is the uh, market, which is extremely unstable, which creates the instability. And, and also the people who basically have control over it, which is the corporations. I see them being completely left out of any responsibility, any discussion in this, and it's all transferred over to the government and over to monetary theory, which is not that impossible to understand that all value is fictional, that money is fractionally, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, that's fine, but that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, which is, has, has to do with power structures. With, yeah, with the, the ruling uh, set. That's, 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 that's why I introduced. Can we take several at once answer every one? Because we'll never get all the questions in unless we take a whole several okay. at once. Okay. Right. Right. I just want to bring that up. If you respond one by one, half the people in the room won't get a chance. Thanks. That's a good Thank suggestion. Um, that's why I started this by saying that the jobs guarantee no, had the opportunity, had the, mm -hmm. had, the, had the opportunity to edge out the private sector entirely. Um, so. Gentlemen in the uh, yeah, so um, yeah, when you hold on to a question so long, it's like a dream deferred and just sort of explodes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I think uh, and so I, I don't want to be sound frustrated. But there is something that is not pragmatic at all about trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Capitalism allowed room for the New Deal, which was, as this gentleman said. A corrective measure to increase buying power, but also primarily, Roosevelt says himself, to save the country from revolution. That's so in right. that sense, it was the effect of a failure. It wasn't a failed project. It was the effect, the result of a failure, namely the failure of a revolution. Now, I know that social democracy still exists. There still is this perspective. But we are born into a rotten system. It's not just bad and corrupt. The government is not corrupt in the least. The government has a job to do and is doing it, doing its very best to maintain the most violent, destructive, exploitive system humanity has ever created. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you're born
has to be made explicitly from the beginning. You cannot make that waiver. Then you need the expiration. The guarantee. out in the open, name it for what it really is. Namely, we need a new society. Oh, we get responses? Uh, I think we're taking more questions. More questions, yes. I think, hold on a second. I think Julia wanted to say something. I think Michael has his hand up. I'm sitting behind him. Since the discussion started, I ignored it. So I think it would be polite to call him. You're off, Michael. To continue Kathy's theme, the fundamental problem that the human race has always had from the agricultural period on is this, that to make the system work, you have to punch people all the time. So you're, you're, you're six years old and you're in school and they're going to, if you don't take to, for instance, history, they're going to punch you. If you don't take to mathematics, they're going to punch you. And then when you get eventually to adulthood, it's like, well, if you don't have a job, we're going to leave you to starve and die. So ultimately, we can have all these bullshit conversations about freedom and democracy, but they're all fucking meaningless because in the end, the system as we have it now, which is entirely dependent upon punching people, right, right, requires that you spend for 40 years, half of your waking life doing something called a job. And Kathy's right. I wouldn't, the problem with letting the government decide what's socially useful, well, right now, the government decides, is deciding that it's socially useful to let a, a bunch of people in blue uniforms kill black people right. without putting them in jail. It also is deciding that it's worthwhile and socially useful to put people in a cage for smoking marijuana. Not a worthwhile thing for my thing. And of course, we'll discuss the military industrial complex at another time. But there's something else. It's the creative process. Not too many people know this. Who has an Apple device? Good. The Apple Corporation was started by crime. How, how Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak created for themselves the time that instead of having to run out to a job so that they could buy transistors and integrated circuits and diodes and resistors and all the other shit that they needed to build their first computer, not to mention having to eat, is they sold blue boxes. You know what a blue box is? Yeah. Who knows what a blue box is? I passed long distance. <laughs> well, for those of you that don't know, once upon a time, it would be a box, it would look like a telephone, right? And it would allow you to make free long distance telephone calls to any place. As a matter of fact, here was the fun part of it. You could use a blue box to make telephone calls that you could not possibly make from your house phone. So if you had a blue box, you could call Cuba. If you had a blue box and you had the telephone number of the premier of the Soviet Union, you could call the premier of the Soviet Union. And they sold, they did this completely illegal activity to finance their enterprise, right? There are some things, trust me, I don't visualize the government financing and I don't visualize private enterprise financing. Why? Because both government and private enterprise are primarily concerned with power and control. So if, unless your gadget or gizmo enhances their power or their control, they're not going to pay for it. So for instance, let me tell you exactly what the chances I think are of private enterprise or the government financing quantum induction reactors. They're zero. And I know most of you don't know what a quantum induction reactor is. But some of you at least have heard this vague rumor that there's a way to produce free energy. There is. It's called the quantum induction reactor. But the problem with that technology is that once you have it, you, from the time you get it till the time you die, you never have to pay another electric bill or gasoline bill or anything else. And you can pass it on to your kids. 
So this is not, if, if this technology ever going to be, is ever invented, it'll be a bunch of crazy people that have free money because they don't have to work and they're hanging out. Uh, that wasn't exactly a question, but there were several questions. Yeah. <laughs> Can I respond? I don't think we're taking questions. Oh, we're still taking questions? Oh, did we have three? Now there are several. Uh, Julia, and then we'll go. Uh, uh, I, I think that guaranteed jobs and UBI are terrific <coughs> ideas. I think that the Fazlina is absolutely right. <laughs> The, the funds are there, all you have to do is write the bill. You know, you all you have to do is put the digits in, right. you don't have to, yeah. have to print anything. So I think that's what, what everybody, basically here has said something about the system. Well, I was so stunned by something in the system the day before yesterday that I just have to mention it and hear what you have to say about it. There was a headline in the business section of the in, conjunct in conjunction uh, with Saudi Arabia, is cre has created a new hedge fund, and the new, you know, you presumably all know that BlackRock is the bad guy hedge fund, right? And Saudi Arabia, you know what that is. Anyway, they have created a new hedge fund, and here's what they're going to invest in. Infrastructure in the United States, tunnels, yes. bridges, of the tunnel I have to go through with, on a, a subway train in the morning to go to work. And so it's just, you know, when, when you judge that compared to this, and everybody keeps saying, oh, this can't happen. Um, is, in fact, you, the panel, have to justify it by giving some way in which we can make this marvelous thing happen. And that one, <laughs> Brock Rock and Saudi Arabia are going to take control of our public transportation. Uh, structures and where do we get money from that? Obviously, I mean, it's pretty obvious what the only way they get any money out of it would be. So, and well, I the thing that bothers me about this job guarantee, and it's piggybacking kind of like on what Kathy and Michael said, is like I, I've been in the shelter system for the past five years. I have a master's degree in film. And when, it, when you go into the shelters, you have to be on welfare. And the welfare people, they, they basically, they try to push you into very narrow certain kinds of work. Security, retail food service, maintenance, home health aid. Very, very narrow. They, they, they do all sorts of BS, like they have you take the Riasic test. In my good shows, I was primarily artistic and investigative. And, but it doesn't matter, because it's all like, it's all like kind of like lip service, because it's like trying to get in. And, and with my physical challenges, I need a job where I can sit down all day and not be confined to a vehicle. It's basically a desk job, and they have no clue how to provide me with a desk job. So the mod, I mean, it bothers me because the existing models we have are just so bad that it, it's like, are these really going to be improved? Because because this is what the government has deemed is necessary for people to do. They don't care how much education you have. They don't care how much experience you have. This is what the, they have for you to do, and it's not it's not a lot of choices. It doesn't pay well. It's physically strenuous, and. Well, there are, they also have a thing where you can like get get into oceans. So again, it's physically strenuous, uh, ignores any kind of education you might have, and that if when, anytime we go beyond this, it, it comes across as utopian pie in the sky because I, it doesn't seem like this is what's going to happen. I mean, I have the background; I could be doing video editing. I write constantly. I'm not getting paid for any of that. I am working. I am working a lot. But, and that is cut into so much by trying to search for a job. So a lot of times I'm not doing this work. I'm, I'm doing job search, and, or I'm getting frustrated with my job search and going on Twitter and stuff and then fighting the right winger and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so it's basically that. And I don't see, I mean, I've been in the show for just five years, and DHS is like, you have so much education, why can't you find a job? And it's because there is a demand. And 
if the, go the government is saying, we've got these for you, and the price, it, I mean, it, it just comes across as utopian to me, more, much more so than the universal basic income, which has its own problems with the Milton Friedman's and all that stuff. Uh, this question is for Catalina. Um, so I often hear the argument that it's the capitalistic system that uh, comes on this problem. But if we had a different system, would that prevent the corruption that we have or would the one percent just find new ways to um, get through loopholes and so create the whole uh, the same problems in a different system? Mm. What is the different system? Whatever coming up one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of the question. When, when we, um, Socialism. About the, about the punitive nature of work. I, this is, I mean, your, your comment here is very important because I want to get rid of all of that. Like the job guarantee is, you know, nobody asked you what you could do. Like mm -hmm. you were not part of the participation of the process of, of thinking what would be useful work and where you can be helpful. Um, and I don't think it's utopian because I've seen it. Like a poor country like Argentina did it. And because the way the model was designed, it was kind of from the bottom up. Communities proposed what they wanted to do. Like they figured out this is what this neighborhood needs. These are the resources we have. You know, we need food kitchens here. We've got you know daycare centers. We need, need X, Y, and Z. You know, we've got people. They you know, and so they proposed it up to the municipality. The municipality then asked for the funds from the federal government. Nobody was breathing down their necks and telling you do this, that, that, that. They were basic guidelines that were provided. So large scale infrastructure. Projects need some, you know, they have technical requirements, etc. But what um, what I saw, at least uh, in the case of Argentina, was very interesting because it provided people with an opportunity to propose themselves their own projects. But also, it was a unique form of microcredit. It wasn't like here's a loan, start a business, let's see if it works out, make sure you repay the loan. It was the government provided kind of seed money for you know wages and materials, and so. When the program was was phased out, there were some people who already were able to do certain things. They got on their feet. There's no way for us to know, you know, because they didn't track those groups as they shut down the program. But what I'm saying is that I think there is a way to do it other ways, and we just have to move away from the current workfare model. That's what we have. Then job guarantee is completely different. It's voluntary and it fits the job to the person. Like that's a key criteria of the job guarantee. Mm -hmm. Can I comment on the, uh, like, who took all the Perfect. money? I think you had some questions along that line. My personal experience was I worked at a job, and I used to think, oh, I wish everybody could have a job like this. It was interesting. It was challenging. It, I, I, I worked for a very large corporation, and I knew many, many people. So when I went to work, I actually had a big social network. Um, it paid really well. Um, I was like, this is great. I good benefits. I wish everybody could have a job like this. And then they booted me. And the thing that struck me basically that day was I couldn't say goodbye to anybody. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm. And I was actually in much better shape now. I put on 50 pounds. I was only out of work six months. And they basically paid me for an entire year. So when you look at it on paper, it's like, well, what's your problem, dude? It's like everything looks great. And it's like I was exiled. I was shown the door, go sit, and it's like, guess what? The door goes like this. You go out and you go, boom, and you're on the bottom. It's like, nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear about what you used to do. So I totally understand the idea of work. I had to go out and get a job. I got a job, but this is my work. I actually sit at work thinking, oh, hmm, UBI, what about this? Oh, what about job program? And I read articles and I listen to videos, and my work is actually, how am I going to solve this? That incident prompted me to say, Those what am I going to do so that this doesn't happen to me again or any of my friends or my kids? And what are my kids going to do? It's like, not only did I get kicked out of a, a nice situation, but it's like, I look at my kids and I'm like, oh, they're screwed. They're so screwed. So essentially, my proposal was, I'm looking for... It reminds me of this movie, Leon, No Women, No Children, boom, and then he takes the guy out. So it was, look, this is a struggle with people who don't care, okay? It, it's not really war. I'm not a violent person, 
but it's a serious matter. And these people need to give up the power that they're holding because they're not wielding it responsibly. So however you want to phrase that, I'm looking at, I want to unseat these people. I want to take the power back from them, okay? My computer's name is Fight the Power. <laughs> the point being that first we gotta, you know, I gotta take care of the old people, right? Because they're, it's not their fault. And I gotta take care of the kids, okay? Everybody who's of working age, everybody who can pick up a pen, please no guns, um, everybody who can pick up a pen, take a train down to Washington, corner some guy in the Capitol and say, look, I want you to do the following. You work for me, get this stuff done. I want you to go do that if you can. So my point is, take care of the people who can't take care of themselves, take the burden on yourself, and go take that power back, okay? Because it's only because we allow them, it's only because we allow these corporations and the managers who run them to do this stuff that they do it. If we didn't allow it, then they wouldn't be doing it. So it's up to us to go down there and take the power back from them. Now, that may be idealistic, you know, there's windmills all over, I may be tilting at them. But essentially, getting laid off from something I spent almost 20 years of my life doing, basically, arbitrarily, pissed me off enough to actually get off my ass and do something. Now, this may not be something, right? We may not be seeing results here, a lot of talking in this left forum, but hey, at least other people are listening, and. You know, I have an audience where maybe I can inspire one or two people to go do something. And yes, they took our money, you know, back in the 1960s, like people said, we'll be working four hours a day and everything would be good. They took all that, they stole it. And similar to the Trump voters who are finding out they got used, there's some of us who feel we got used and they took it all and we want it back. So if anybody wants to come help me get it back, please join us and, uh, we're going to start small, start very specific, and work up from there. Um, uh, yeah. A bunch of questions at last. Particularly, uh, you brought something up, and, and you also. One of the reasons why I mentioned that struggle is beyond escape is that even if we get uh, UBI working, it would still be a case of struggle. And uh, so it, it's not uh, a magic pill by any means. There still needs to be uh, a major, major changes, if, if not the, the, the collapse of a particular economic structure. And also an overarching thing that um, we talk about at, um, at Upper Occupy. Um, I think Kathy will remember, at one, one time we came around and we said, well, it's, what we're talking about more than anything else is it's, it's you of power. And um, so it's, it's about who can wrestle it from who. It will always fall to that in the final analysis. And I don't think that's, uh, that is to be forgotten uh, by anyone. I won't forget it. But this is a, a when we talk about UBI, we're talking about things that are, yes, they are interim. They're interim just like unemployment was interim. Uh, um, and uh, social security and all these, all these different things. These are things that, um, yes, come about in the ugliness of uh, capitalist uh, domination. But at the same time, if, if you, you, you have completely flushed capitalism down the drain. There is a long period in which people can be hurt or helped. And if we can do something in the meantime that helps their situation, I think it's a good thing. So this is this is why I'm for UBI. And, um, and also, uh, I'll add the whole business of utopia. A lot of people sort of laugh and say that. But in a way, you have to have a touch of utopia, a utopianism in almost any, anything that's going to work probably will still have a touch of that in it, because it would be that drastic. Uh, you have to be reminded of the scientists who, um, um, physicists who said to somebody who had just found out and proposed 
the way of um, finding, to, to bring Einstein's theory of relativity married to quantum physics. And he said, when he heard of the idea, he said, well, it sounds crazy, but is it crazy enough? <laughs> and so everything has to have a little, maybe a little touch of utopianism. It, it must seem to be, ah, oh, that we can never do that because of the bind we're in. I, I think that that's almost inevitable. So I don't, I never sort of want to push them on completely aside if what they say has a, a touch of utopianism inside of it. I think even liberation from capitalism has a touch of utopianism inside of it. And yet still we, I think most of us want that. Um, and, uh, Maybe I'll say something later. I want to address one issue. Um, I didn't mean to ignore your question about the next system, and mostly because I'm not, a, I, I'm not qualified to speak about how we go to the next system. Um, what, what I study is this monetary system. And so I'm very interested in exercises in utopia. What's the next vision? How we go there? What does it look like? You know, how do you organize life? But how do you go from here to there, given this monetary system is the pressing problem? And this monetary system is a system which uh, you know, we want to give people income. We gotta give them dollars, however many that is, 250 or 25,000, we wanna give them money. Uh, and I'm going back to this point that the dollar is worthless, right? It's, it's a fiat currency, it, it doesn't, it, we, you know, it is issued it's not backed by gold, it's not backed by anything, it is fiat currency. And the way we make it worth something is that it chases few goods, you know, it is it's scarce. We don't organize our production process in, in, in a way to provide full employment. And, and what really gives it value is that the government demands that you pay all your debt in dollars. So the government says, I'm gonna print a whole bunch of dollars, I'm gonna put a bunch of obligations here, property taxes, real estate taxes, you know, uh, profit, you know, the sales taxes, income taxes, and you gotta pay in my resource. Mm -hmm. So that, whether we like it or not, that's how the system works. Right. And it, it turns out it's worked like this in many societies. It's, it's always some sort of tax and non-reciprocal obligation that has created demand for the government-issued currency. Again, Argentina is the most late, the recent example of how this, this works. So now think about it this way. The government gives you dollars. How do you have man. to give them back to me in the form of taxes? And then it says, by the way, I'll provide you unconditional dollars on as needed basis. What is that dollar worth? Right? If so, if, if, if the tax creates a demand for scarce currency. So the government says, okay, I'm going to give you dollars, but you have to work for me. You know, I need police force. I need to provision myself. I'm the government, so I'm going to impose a tax on you, so that not that you have to give me money but you have to give me labor, you have to give me work. And so you have to get my currency to pay the tax that I imposed on you, because that's, you can't escape that. And how would you get the money that I only have the privilege of issuing? Is by working, delivering something to me. And that's how the public sector provisions itself by creating demand for otherwise <coughs> useless currency. And now when you add the basic income guarantee and you provide it freely, you have completely negated that mechanism. You, you eroded the value, that currency is worth nothing to you. You don't have to work for it. So if the goal of the UBI is to debauch the value of the currency and thus transition to the next system, then that's an argument to make. That's not an argument I'm gonna make, but it is an argument to make. If, this, if the argument is can we use the monetary system to move to a better place, the public monopoly over the currency to be employed for the public good, then I think the job guarantee is the way that these two things are connected because it anchors the value of the currency in labor hour. I would just, I would hope, uh, love to hear the panelists or the partners of UBI talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts. Because just to get back to the, the introduction of this whole thing, one of the reasons why it seems that so many people are talking about UBI is because you actually have a lot of very influential conservatives pushing for UBI as well. So it's, it's not a pipe dream or utopian compared to, say, 
a jobs guarantee. It actually seems to be more on the agenda now than at any time since the 70s. And on that note, when I've heard conservatives talk about UBI, they're actually far more generous than you were. They, you know, they have different numbers, but even on the low end, the way that they deal with making sure they don't get inflation is that the amount of money they give at the UBI is not enough to ever be comfortable, but enough that say, you know, if you're driving a part-time Uber, you don't have to live up with Uber. So it's like 15 to 18,000 to maybe 20,000 tops. And so it's enough you don't starve, but not enough that if you actually want, you know, the comforts of capitalism, that you can also get those for free. So I mean, do those numbers at all work for you from a left perspective, or is that? Well, again, if I may, um, I think you you framed it correctly. The right wants that because uh -huh. what the right is looking at is the lack of demand. So, you know, I only study all of this a little bit. That's not you know what I got my degree in. But the point is that they're looking at it like, gee, we can't make as much money as we used to because people don't have money to spend. So we'll give them a little bit of money and we'll be sure that they spend it, but we won't give them so much that they save it, right? Uh, so it's like, you know, what are they gonna do when they're old? Oh, well, we don't care, you know? What are they gonna do when their kid has to go to school? We don't care. We just wanna make sure that we give them enough money so that they funnel it back to us, okay? So that's why I basically said, the, 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 the proposal I made was like, it was a stealth way of saying, we're gonna actually pump up the future benefits of the program that already exists by an accounting trick. And then we're gonna give some cash to people because everybody needs a little extra cash and there is a demand problem. So we're going to address that so that nobody can ever say, well, you guys didn't do UBI. I said, yeah, we did, see, we gave rebates. People got a few thousand dollars a year. Okay, fine. But that's not the main thing. My main proposal is what she was saying, and I look at it as a non-market mechanism for dealing with what I need in my life, okay? I don't necessarily wanna pay cash. I mean, in my household, I've got five people living in my household. We don't exchange cash for what we do in the house. If you have to wash the dishes, I'm not paying you to do that. You're doing it because that's part of your social obligation, okay? So I think a non-market mechanism for providing the basic necessities of life is the first step to saying, you know, F you capitalism, <laughs> F you neoliberalism, the market isn't the answer to everything. In fact, that's the big problem in a lot of ways. Um, you know, hey, those bridges and tunnels, those belong to us. You know, you, we're not gonna privatize all our public assets because you want more money, you neoliberal, sorry. But, you know, that's the current framework. If you look at it as a market framework rather than a human-centric framework where people need to take care of and they need to take care of each other, then it's a very different story. So I think the right wing likes it because it maintains the market framework. We're basically saying, yes, there is some need to deal with the market as it exists today, but fundamentally, don't put all your energy there. Put your energy in something that will undermine the market and, and use another mechanism. At least that's my stance. Others may have different influence. We have another four minutes. Um, so I've, I'm not very good at teaching surfing, actually. And I really don't want to work. Would you provide any support? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there it is. Sorry. If you want to be out of it, out of the society, why are you asking for our, for our society to mobilize our resources? Because you're going to have to eat, and you're going to, I suppose, have to use, right? 
Well, if you're well, reading if you're and you're learning quiet, and you're becoming smarter, that that's contributing to something. Like, why does it have to be a one way? Government. It's not, no, I'm not saying. You don't say that to elderly people. No, I, we don't, but we support. There is There are certain kinds of things that we support. You have in retirement income, uh, but we don't support somebody from start to finish without any contribution, right? So of course you, uh, you know, we won't let you. So it is supplemental with guaranteed income child allowance is one of those. We don't ask children to work, right? But we recognize that you want to support children. So it is, you know, it does have an income component. <laughs> Sorry about the sound, guys. You had to. Hi, Paulina. Hi, real quick. Thank you. That's all I wanted you to say hi to us. Thank you, dear. Thank you.